Hey everyone, in this video I'll try to summarize the various models of light and the relevant experiments in HSC physics. As an overview, we'll go through the following four models, Thomson's model, Rutherford's model, Bohr's model, and finally Schrodinger's model. Before we delve into the first model of the atom, it is important to understand our early understanding of the atom. And that is, we thought atoms were indivisible and indestructible. So there was no understanding of subatomic particles as we now know today, which make up the atoms themselves. We also knew that atoms of the same element had the same mass and chemical as well as physical properties. And in terms of chemistry, we know that various compounds were formed by combining atoms of different elements. So you can see our early understanding of the atom compared to what we now know today was very basic and half correct at best. Thomson's experiment involving cathode rays led to his discovery of electrons. In this experiment, he used electric and magnetic fields to determine the charge to mass ratio of cathode rays, which confirmed the particle nature of cathode rays, as we now know them as stream of moving electrons. In addition, Thomson also showed that the charge to mass ratio of these electrons is constant regardless of the metallic material that was used as cathode to produce a cathode ray in the first instance. This led him to conclude that electrons are subatomic particles that is universal, which means it's present in all materials. Thomson's discovery of the electron ultimately led to the development of the very first model, which is Thomson's atomic model. This is also known as the plum pudding model. In this model, Thomson described the atom as made of negatively charged electrons dispersed within a positive sphere. Of course, the presence of electrons in atoms came from his experiment on cathode rays. The reason why he proposed these electrons must be embedded within a positive sphere is because at the time we knew all atoms were electrically neutral. That is, overall, they didn't have a positive nor negative charge. Since electrons were negatively charged, Thomson thought there must be a positive matter that neutralized all the negative charges of these electrons in order to give the atom its neutral charge. However, at the time, there was no experimental evidence to suggest that this positively charged matter, which suspended electrons, was actually correct. After Thomson's model came the gold foil experiment, in which two scientists, Geiger and Marsden, fired alpha particles at a thin gold foil. In this experiment, they observed that most of the alpha particles travel straight through the thin foil with little to no deflections. And more importantly, a few of these alpha particles deflected at very large angles, as you can see by the diagram. So most of the particles went straight through without any deflection, and a minority of them were deflected at very large angles. This experiment contradicted Thomson's model because if Thomson's model of the atom was true, the alpha particles would have passed straight through the atom as the presence of negatively charged electrons would have played no role in the trajectory of the much heavier alpha particles. If Thomson's model was correct, then most of the alpha particles would have passed straight through with little to no deflection, and none of the alpha particles would have been deflected at a very large angle. The presence of electrons within the plum pudding model wouldn't have been able to cause deflection of such a big angle because electrons, although they are negatively charged, they are much lighter in terms of mass compared to alpha particles. The results of the gold foil experiment led Rutherford to propose a new model of the atom. In this model, Rutherford proposed that in an atom, there exists a concentrated positively charged region in the center of the atom called the nucleus. He set this to account for the large angle deflections that were seen in minority alpha particles. When the select few alpha particles collided with the positively charged nucleus of the gold atom, the electrostatic repulsion between the alpha particles and the gold nucleus resulted in a deflection of a very substantial angle that was seen in the gold foil experiment. In contrast to the electrons, the collision between alpha particles and the gold nucleus resulted in a significant deflection because the mass of the gold nucleus, which comprised of protons and neutrons as we now know today, was much more significant compared to that of electrons. Rutherford's model also proposed that most of the atom actually consisted of empty space. 
This is because in Geiger and Marsden's Gulf War experiment, most of the alpha particles still pass straight through the atom with little to no deflection. And Rutherford justified this by saying this is because most of the atom was actually empty space. Lastly, Rutherford further proposes that the electrons in the atom actually orbited around the central positive nucleus, otherwise stationary electrons would have been pulled towards the nucleus due to the electrostatic attraction between the positive nucleus and the negatively charged electrons. Although Rutherford's model was a big improvement compared to Thomson's model in that it accounted for the observations of the gold foil experiment, it has two main limitations. The first limitation is that Rutherford could not account for the mass or the composition of the nucleus. Although he discovered the existence of protons later on, the total combined atomic mass of the nucleus still was unaccounted for, and this is because the neutron was yet to be discovered. The second limitation of Rutherford's model was that he could not explain the stability of these orbiting electrons. In classical physics, when the electrons undergo uniform circular motion as they orbit the nucleus, they will experience centripetal acceleration. And by Maxwell's electromagnetism theory, Whenever charges undergo acceleration, they should theoretically emit electromagnetic radiation, EMR for short. This means as the electrons experience centripetal acceleration throughout the orbit, they should be producing EMR and slowly lose energy. So as these electrons lose energy, they will eventually spiral into the nucleus as they do not have sufficient speed to maintain their orbit around the nucleus. Now, of course, if electrons had actually spiraled into the nucleus, this will neutralize all the positive charge of the protons in the nucleus, which will result in a nucleus that's actually neutrally charged. We know that the nucleus must be positively charged because of the observations of the gold foil experiment. In Chadwick's experiment, he fired alpha particles at a block of beryllium to produce neutrons which, when further projected onto a block of paraffin wax, caused protons to be ejected from the paraffin wax. Chadwick analyzed the kinetic energy and momentum of these particles, and by applying the law of conservation of energy as well as momentum, he was able to deduce that these neutrons were in fact particles and not radiation. He also found that the mass of the neutron was slightly greater than that of the proton. I discussed the discovery of the neutron in more detail in a separate video. Now, Chadwick's discovery of the neutron was quite significant as it added to Rutherford's pre-existing model, as we now know that the nucleus is comprised of both a proton and a neutron. Before we discuss Bohr's atomic model, it is important to understand the hydrogen emission spectrum. The light emitted from a gas discharge tube containing hydrogen, when passed through a single slit, through a glass triangular prism produces multiple discrete visible lines on a black background. This is known as the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Before the development of Bohr's model, scientists were conflicted as to why these lines were produced when the light was analyzed this way. It is important to understand that Bohr's atomic model was developed in a manner to account for the production of these emission lines of the hydrogen, hydrogen atom. In Bohr's model, he proposed three postulates. In the first postulate, Bohr proposes that electrons orbit the nucleus in what he called stationary states, with each electron orbit being associated with a specific and quantized energy level. This means the radius as well as the energy associated with each orbit is a multiple of a number, which is why they're described as quantized. Bohr also said that when the electrons orbit in these stationary states, or orbits of specific energies, they do not emit radiation, as predicted by Maxwell's electromagnetism theory, and therefore the energy will remain constant, allowing them to maintain a stable orbit and continue to orbit around the nucleus. The first postulate was Bohr's way of resolving one of the limitations of Rutherford's model. The second postulate in Bohr's model is that electrons can transition between these energy states by either absorbing or releasing energy. Now Bohr said, the further away an orbit is from the nucleus, the higher the energy level it has. Electrons can actually absorb a certain amount of energy to transition from a lower to a higher energy level. Vice versa, 
an electron can return to a lower energy level by releasing the same amount of energy. Or specify that the energy absorbed and released during this electron transition must be specific in that it must be equal to the difference between the energy levels or states involved in the transition. If the energy that's given is any less or any more than this exact amount, then the electron will not be able to transition between the different energy states. And thirdly, Bohr's model also proposes that the angular momentum of the electron is quantized. It is important for me to remind you and for you to understand that Bohr's first postulate with the quantized energy levels, the so-called stationary state, was an attempt to resolve the limitation of Rutherford's model. He tried to use this quantized energy state to explain the stable nature of these electrons as they revolve around the nucleus. The second postulate, namely the electron transition between different orbits when absorbing and emitting the correct amount of energy, was to account for the discrete emission lines present in the hydrogen spectrum. Or said these emission lines are due to the production of visible light, which is a form of electromagnetic radiation, when electrons return from a high energy state to a lower energy state in the hydrogen atom. If you want to learn more about the concept of spectroscopy and the hydrogen emission spectrum, I recommend going to its own video. Like all models, Bohr's model was also not perfect. There are numerous limitations that you must know. The main ones include Bohr's model combines ideas from both classical and quantum physics. In his first postulate, he describes electrons undergoing uniform circular motion around the nucleus, which is an idea derived from classical physics. But in his postulates, he also refers to ideas of quantum physics, namely the quantized energy levels in the first postulate and the quantized nature of the electron's angular momentum. Although Bohr's first postulate tries to resolve one of Rutherford's model's limitations, he actually doesn't explain the basis or provides any further justification to what the stationary states are and why electrons do not emit radiation as per Maxwell's electromagnetism theory. Furthermore, Bohr's model was founded upon the hydrogen atom, so the predictions and postulates made by Bohr's model becomes far less accurate for multi-electron atoms. This basically refers to most elements that are heavier than hydrogen. There are numerous other limitations which are less so important. Bohr's model cannot account for the relative intensity of emission lines, that is, why some emission lines in the hydrogen atom were brighter than the others. He could not account for the presence of hyperfine lines, that is, why when a single emission line is magnified, we can see the presence of multiple thinner and more fine lines that will make up a single emission line. Bohr's model also cannot account for Zeeman's and Stark's effect, which is the effect of magnetic and electric fields on the splitting of emission lines respectively. Again, I discuss all of these limitations in more detail in its own video on Bohr's model. Finally, Schrodinger's model is purely based on quantum physics. And it is important to also know and remind yourself that Schrodinger's model assumes electrons behave as waves. This is a stark difference between Schrodinger's model and its preceding models. For example, in Bohr's model, Bohr still describes electrons as negatively charged particles that orbit the nucleus. Schrodinger completely changes that perception and says that actually electrons behave as standing waves which is an idea that he borrowed from de Broglie's matter wave theory. Assuming that electrons behave as waves, Schrodinger also developed mathematical equations to describe the wave behavior of electron waves. The solution to the Schrodinger equation provides specific energy values that defines where electrons can be found in a given atom. This leads to the new idea of orbital in Schrodinger's model. Orbitals refer to a region in which there's a high probability or chance of finding an electron. It is very important for you to be aware that the term orbital is very different to the term orbit. An orbit is an idea derived from Bohr's model which describes the actual orbiting path of the electron as a particle, whereas the term orbital simply describes the region in which there's a high probability of locating an electron where the electron is understood as a wave. 
The limitations of Schrodinger's model are quite difficult to understand unless you're delving deeper into quantum physics. Schrodinger's model is quite difficult to understand as a physical model of the atom, and this is a big difference between Schrodinger's probabilistic model versus Bohr's model where he actually described the physical path of electron orbits. And secondly, to add that little extra detail to your current knowledge, Schrodinger's model and its equations as well as mathematical predictions does not account for Einstein's theory of special relativity. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.